Okay, I think we are ready to start the second session, uh, which is about uh, the election results and the voting behavior. We will have three presentations. The first one is from Professor Salvatore Vassallo from the University of Bologna. Thank, thank you for inviting me. And I have a very uh, brief and hope clear presentation uh, that can be summarized in five sentences that you can read here. Um, I will say that the Rosato law has been a reasonable compromise. There is a debate about this because uh, the winning parties, especially the Five Star Movements and North and the National League, uh, have just five points uh, that you can read here um, about the results, but also about the impact of the electoral system uh, that is blamed uh, uh, by the Five Star Movement and National League leaders especially, because they say that it was uh, purposely designed uh, to prevent them to win big and they have the opportunity to form a politically cohesive government, single party or single coalition uh, government. My argument is that the Rosado law was a reasonable compromise. There was no room for any other um, better solution. The election result, this is the second point, uh, as a sharp uh, geographical pattern is quite clear. There are strong differences in the results among the different areas of the country. And uh, on one side, this hides the electoral system disproportionality. Uh, the electoral system could have been much more disproportional and probably fabricate a majority if the electoral result uh, would have been less uh, disomogeneous, territorially disomogeneous. On the other hand, these uh, strong differences in the territorial results clearly reveals uh, the main social drivers uh, uh, behind the populist party's uh, success. The, f uh, the last uh, uh, proposition is that with, the, with this kind of structure of the party system that has been uh, uh, pictured by the electoral results with four main parties of three poultry party groupings uh, that are differently aligned along two dimensions, there are different possible paths for the party system change and also for the government coalition. Um, so, uh, first of all, just brief uh, mm, something about uh, the electoral system. As you probably know, from 1994 to 2000, uh, 2008, we had a bipolar party system with two party coalition, pre-electoral coalitions, with more or less the same amount of votes and uh, with the result that in every election, every general elections, there was a clear or uh, enough clear winner. Uh, but in all that cases, uh, the winner gets at least 45% of the votes and just from five to 50% of the seats is a sort of majority bonus with different electoral systems. But from, from 1994 to 2008, the bonus seats, the, the amount of seats gained by the winner was not more than five or 50% more than the proportional electoral results. Uh, on the contrary, in 2013, we had a very strange result uh, with a very few, uh, very short margin. Uh, the center right won a huge, big majority of seats in the House. Uh, they got 29.2% uh, of the votes for the chamber against the uh, 29.2% of the votes uh, uh, for the center right, but they got 54% of the seats in the chamber, uh, which is uh, almost three times the number of seats uh, the center right got. 
But this was not enough to make a clear uh, um, politically cohesive majority because in the Senate that was not the case. So there was just one possibility and actually now with our structure of the electoral voting and a bicameral system, there is just one uh, possible institutional strategy to uh, obtain a clear electoral result in a general parliamentary elections, which means what the center life, the center left tried to do through the constitutional reform and the so-called Italicum electoral system, which means uh, uh, abolish the power of confidence uh, in the Senate, abolish the Senate or subtract the power of confidence uh, to the Senate and give a clear majority to the main party with a uh, majority bonus seat at the national level. But as you know, uh, this possible solution was rejected through the constitutional referendum. So after the rejection of the constitutional reform and the constitutional court review of the Italicum, a pure proportional system uh, was enforced. So the status quo, because the before the Rosato law reform was a pure proportional electoral system. At the same time, no party would have voted for a more majoritarian system for many different reasons. The, the, the most, of it, most of it is that a more uh, majoritarian system, a purely plurality system, for instance, would have given all the member of parliaments from Lombardy to the center right, all the member of parliament of the Sicily to the center right, in the, what was expected at the time, uh, all the member of parliaments for Emilia Romagna to the center right, the center left. So it uh, was very, very difficult to imagine that the parliamentary groups uh, could uh, agree on a completely, a system completely based on a plurality uh, system. So they uh, uh, try with this uh, uh, new mixed member system, in my view, much less proportional than uh, um, many things and say, and, say uh, and I can show you why. I, I probably don't have to explain in detail uh, the nature and characteristics of the electoral system. What is important to say here that uh, um, we can have an idea on how the electoral system works or can work after having an idea on how the people vote, voted. So my second point is a sharp geographical pattern of voting. Uh, what we see clearly from the uh, aggregate data uh, is that the southern voters massively move toward the Five Star Movement while Northern voters massively moved towards the National League. And the national the structure of the competition has changed, so in all traditional geopolitical zones. Now you see here the percentages of votes uh, of, for the far left, uh, Liberi Uguali, the center left, plus the SVP in Trentino Alto Adige, uh, Five Star Movement, center right, uh, and for 2013, the center located coalition led by Mario Monti. So now, as you can easily see, in uh, north and red zone, which means uh, Emilia Romagna, Toscana, uh, Marche, Umbria, the center right uh, uh, get a, a great success uh, winning uh, 13, 12, percent of votes more than in 2013. Uh, the Five Star Movement uh, had a great uh, success in the South, plus 16 percent of vote uh, in, um, if you compare the 2018 result with that of 2013, while center-left uh, simply uh, lose less in the North but lost big in most, uh, both in the red zone and in the south. So why in the past we had a dominated party system in the red zone with the center left 
um, strongly ahead of the two uh, of the other competitors, a bipolar uh, competition in the north, uh, a sort of tripolar competition in the south. Now we have uh, a dominated party system in the north by the center right, a dominated party system in the south by the Feistel movement, and a sort of tripolar competition in the mid, in the, cent, in the red zone. Uh, usually, you see the, uh, geo the, the political map of Italy after the 2018 elections this way, uh, which means with color uh, that represent where where the center right or the Feister movement or the center left won seats in the single member districts. Actually, I think this is a, a more informative way to see the electoral results because in this way you can see uh, the yellow zone, which is the area of the country where the Feister movements uh, have no competitor. Uh, I use as a cutting point uh, at distance of five, uh, uh, 7.5 uh, percentage points from uh, 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 between the first, which means in this case uh, uh, the Feister movement candidate and the others. Uh, a clearly dominated uh, center right by the center right zone in the north and uh, many other areas in the middle uh, that have a different competition structure. For instance, where do you where, where you see a, back, a yellow background and blue dots? That is an area where uh, there is a competition between faster movement and center right, uh, with the center left uh, far uh, distant. Uh, where you see a uh, blue color in a uh, black, black, sorry, background. background, and red points. This is an area where it, there is a competition between uh, center right and center left with five star movement uh, uh, far distant. Is the Rosatellum a proportional system? Uh, actually, it didn't manufacture a majority. This is the, the, the reason why is uh, uh, called in question, but only due to the contrasting results in the north and in the south, both in the south and in the, uh, and in the north, the winners were awarded a substantial prize. So if you consider uh, as two different words, the so-called Padania and uh, uh, the two Sicilies kingdom, which means the north and the south, uh, you see that the, the results are very different. Also, if you measure the index usually used to uh, measure the um, level of disproportionality in political science, you see that uh, it is quite low in the average of Italy for 5.0 for the chamber, 5.9 for the Senate. But if you measure the same index uh, distinctively for the south and the north, you see that the winner uh, get a huge bonus and the index is higher. This is important not only because shows that the the, the, the potential disproportionality of the electoral system, but also because uh, make uh, quite apparent which, is, which are the underlining social drivers of votes in 2018. And uh, in a nutshell, it is a sort of confirmation of a theory, a general theory about the diffusion of populist parties and populists in Europe, because we can see uh, that the north-south divide in Italy in 2018 reflects the impact of the same two social drivers, uh, cultural insecurity and demand for restrictive migration policies in the north, economic insecurity and demand for state income transfer in the south. Uh, so I, uh, I know I have to rush, so uh, if you want we can discuss about this later. Uh, there is a way to summarize the literature about the determinants and variants on populism in Europe. Uh, we say that there are uh, long 
ter long, long, long run trends uh, uh, behind uh, um, globalization, digital revolution, some recent shocks, uh, refugee crisis and great recession that push uh, uh, the public opinion towards this kind of feelings that there are stronger in the north, uh, socially, in some, ca in some cases, stronger in the north of Europe and in the north of Italy, social insecurity and demand for restrictive immigration policies, other that are stronger in the south of Europe and in the south of Italy, economic insecurity and demand for uh, income transfer and state uh, protection. But in Italy, there is a, a, a clear peculiarity. The salience of the argument that already Filippo stressed, uh, the, anti the pure anti-establishment and populist uh, claim that make it possible for a party like the Five Star Movement to get a huge amount of uh, uh, electoral support uh, with a, a centrist uh, position, with center located position. Uh, there are reasons because this was possible, especially in 2013. There are evidences that the two main issues for it, the Italian voters were unemployment and immigration. Also, in historical terms, uh, there is a clear tendency between 2012 and 2017 in the growing saliency of uh, the immigration issue and the uh, uh, persistent salience of unemployment issue. And we can also see that there is a clear relationship also to, to, be, uh, to be studied and discussed about uh, how the two issues are related geographically with the electoral result. What is very striking is, for instance, the strong, very strong correlation between the um, percentage of uh, employed, so the, the index of em employment in the single provinces of Italy and the percentages of vote for the Five Star Movements. Uh, this is quite impressive in the social sciences and uh, squad air of uh, 0 0.8. Uh, it is questionable for many reasons, but I think this is a very strong evidence that there are, in this case, two very strong social drivers. I think that we, we could say in a certain way what is told uh, in the past about the British politics, uh, the famous political science Pulitzer that said uh, uh, classes, the base of party politics in Britain, of all else is uh, embellishment and details. Usually, the Italian politics very complicated. My idea is that in this time, this time in 2008, uh, the explanation of the election result it qui it's quite simple. There are two main issues. Most of the else is embellishment and details. The two issues are immigration and uh, income insecurity, and this is what is behind the. Uh, great success in the north of the uh, National League and in the south of the Feistel movement. This obviously uh, poses some questions about the future possible coalitions and the, the, the development of the party system structure. It is, it is already uh, discussed in, in previous uh, presentations. I just uh, leave this uh, graph as uh, um, promise of future discussion if you want. Okay. Thank you. So we have had some considerations about uh, the geographical pattern of voting, about uh, the effects of the electoral system, whether it, you, it has been uh, more majoritarian or proportional. We may open now the, the, the floor to, to the discussion, uh, to the questions and answers. Uh, so if some of you uh, have questions. I, I was very interested in what you showed about the, um, the disproportionality of the electoral system. I, this is the first time I see these uh, disaggregated 
uh, evidence. I was thinking, and, and broadly, I think, in the public debate, we think of this electoral system as a rather uh, proportional system, so almost perfectly proportional system in its results. So you're suggesting that actually the proportionality comes from cancelling out of two different disproportionalities. The compensation is, uh, of the two different proportion, disproportionality. I've just applied distinctively the Rosato law to the southern and northern results. And as you can see, with the same electoral system uh, in the south, the Feistel movement has a, a more than 50% bonus, which means a bonus larger than the average bonus we have uh, seen in the past nationally, okay? And this is the same, exactly the same in the north in favor of the center-right coalition. Uh, but actually, we have, we have, uh, we have done uh, simulations in the past, and we know well that if the Feister movement wouldn't have, have won so uh, big in the south, the center-right would have had possibility to get the majority. I have only one question concerning your first point. I did not understand why the PD supported the idea of writing an electoral law. The Constitutional Court had to leave uh, alive an electoral law. Uh, the so-called normativa di risulta is an obligation in constitutional law. You cannot uh, abolish the electoral system. It was an awful normativa di risulta, but was legal, even more than legal, constitutional. Why to touch it? Because now it would have been completely evident, first, that the court did something crazy, second, that it was urgent immediately to write a new electoral law. Now it will take again two years with great pleasure of specialists of electoral laws, I understand, but for, not for the well of the country. So I, you say it's okay, this law perhaps, but why they did it? Sure. Uh, because the, alter the alternative was a pure proportional system, which means a certain hang, a certainly hang parliament with no possibility, sure. The, uh, at, the, at that time, I think, I, I know the idea exactly, but I think at that time, they imagined that uh, there was a possibility for the Democratic Party to maintain more or less their consent, uh, being the first party, uh, and play a major role in a situation similar to that, but with different balances and with a certain amount of advantage produced by the majoritarian component to have the possibility to uh, make an agreement to form a government. Okay, we can uh, uh, move to the next presentation by Paolo Bellucci, professor from the University of Siena. The title of his presentation is uh, Rival Models of Voting Choice. Mine would be less beautiful. Uh, Salvatore's last point was that uh, the Italian elections were waged and won on two issues, economic insecurity and uh, cultural insecurity. And uh, what I will try to show is that there is this explanation is a sound one, and which, may, which could be supplemented by others. Now, uh, just a few background. Uh, those who, like myself, who do research on voting behavior, uh, they, we always try to make uh, some distinction among how voters reason, how voters vote the way they do. And in the literature, there are three main models. One is the most established one, the socio-psychological model, according to which 
people vote their social belonging. So parties are diverse in terms of representing social classes or religious beliefs of territorial units. So people vote their social identity. And another model, which is the one pursued by <coughs> Lorenzo, is the issue voting model, which is basically a rational. This model sees voters as rational actors who try to maximize their <coughs> interest, and they do it by choosing, picking a party which is closest to their ideology, interest, whatever. But in this model, the voter is a rational actor. And then, more recently, a new model, a new perspective, a new paradigm developed, which is the, reason, the reasoning voter model in which uh, voters are not actually rational actors. We all have little information, so we try to balance our previous, let's say, predisposition, ideology, and uh, with the more <coughs> uh, simple events which take place during the electoral campaign. Now, uh, the social psychological model is fading. It's fading basically for two reasons. The transformation of uh, society, the economic, the social, the stratification of society on one hand, and on the other hand is the change, the change in nature of parties. The, the outcome of these dual processes is that voters <coughs> Uh, have now weaker ties to parties. Partisanship, they are, party identification is a weaker uh, determinant of voting behavior. And these, according to some scholars, explain why we have so much volatility in elections across time. Uh, there is uh, this other model which is, being, is uh, being pursued more and more by scholars and is the one which I try to <laughs> describe this morning to you, applying to the Italian case in 2018. So basically, uh, people look at some cues, they look for some cues, and they found cues and, uh, and, and reasons for voting by looking at uh, what the government has done, what my, my preferences are, uh, whether I'm satisfied or not with the outgoing the incumbent government. Uh, whether some leaders, some parties exhibit some competence, they are clever, they, are, they have the, uh, the capacity. And then, uh, as the last line, the leadership evaluation, we, are, we are seem to be living in a, in a, in a, in a time of uh, increasing personalization of politics. So the image of the leader becomes, has become more and more important. But before going, getting to the the Italian <coughs> results, uh, we must try, I, I mean, we have to face it, to frame it within the <coughs> pan-European context, that what we have seen in, uh, after the Great Recession is that the challenging parties, populist parties as we, we call it, I mean, they have uh, had great success in most European countries. And, uh, the, ex the basic explanation provided for their success has to do with uh, uh, this uh, idea that Crazy uh, put forward years ago that globalization has created losers and winners. And uh, these uh, losers and winners can be both in terms of economic uh, interests and also in terms of uh, cultural uh, identity. And uh, together with this globalization perspective, the nature, the perception of the EU, of the supranational European Union has changed. And while in the past, EU was seen as a way to regulate globalization, now has been perceived and uh, uh, political entrepreneurs have put forward the image of Europe as the main source, the cause of globalization. So Europe is perceived, as being perceived in many quarters, mainly as negative. What, are, what is behind uh, the, then the findings that uh, the results that Salvatore has shown us earlier? Uh, there, there are some hypotheses. There is, a, first of all, there could be an economic voting. People are satisfied with their 
the economic situation, are satisfied with uh, the way the incumbent government uh, performed, so they vote against the government parties. Then there is the issue that Salvatore raised, the cultural and economic insecurity. And, but also there is the, the issue that uh, Tronconi talked about, referring to the five-star movement, which is the anti-partitism, the attitude, anti-establishment attitude, which is very strong. Then there is the, the reaction to globalization and to the EU. And then there is the importance of leadership. Uh, what the data I will, the, these are initial findings uh, that I will show you now come from the Italian National Election Study role in construction, and I'm showing you only the data coming from the pre-election study, even though I'm quite confident that the results with the post-election study uh, would be basically replicated. Now, first of all, <coughs> voting intention during the campaign. Uh, uh, a rolling cross-section is a, a survey which takes place every day by interviewing a small sample, 200 people, 200 voters, every day throughout the electoral campaign. So we have a huge amount, 8,000 people being interviewed. What we see here is the evolution of campaign, of the voting intention during the campaign. Uh, Okay, this, this yellow line is not very visible, but this is, is it looks, it shows the, how over the campaign support for the five-star movement increased. Uh, by contrary, the support for the PD remained stable, and uh, over time, the Northern League, the Liga, no, La Liga, got better while Forza Italia worsened. So this is a, uh, just how the uh, campaign developed. And this is also interesting because this data came from a web survey. So these data show that through a web survey we are able to follow uh, quite uh, precisely the evolution of public opinion over time. I said at the beginning economic voting and uh, the performance of the government. This, is the, this graph shows the <clears throat> how the popularity of the government changed over time. If we look at uh, the popularity of, uh, let's see if, okay, of uh, Renzi, he was very high at the beginning, then it dropped, then Gentiloni came in and basically Gentiloni kept. Gentiloni was able to do a little bit better than Renzi, but not that much. Hmm? Now, if we look at uh, at the evaluation of government performance, which is uh, how people thought of uh, how well the government did, we see that uh, only 25% of the people said that the government did well, positive. Uh, a majority gave a negative evaluation of the government, and among the people who gave this evaluation, the share of vote intention for the Five Star Movements and for the right coalition was uh, strongest. Uh, how did the economy do over the last 12 months? Well, not very well, I would say. Those, among those who gave a negative evaluation, you can see that 55% voted for the five-star movements. Mm -hmm. so this is a clear sign, clear. It's a clear story. Here you have a graph. You see that moving from worsen to improved economy, the support for the PD grows, but <laughs> the support of the, for the um, five-star movements at the right is very high among the people who have a negative evaluation, who gave a negative evaluation of the economy. What are Italy's most important problems? We uh, Salvatore showed a graph uh, covering a longer time span. This is just over the electoral campaign. There are four issues which were perceived as most important for themselves and for the country, and uh, unemployment, uh, political corruption, tax, and immigration. If we compare the public opinion concerns with their vote intention, we see that there is a clear distinction between uh, issue ownership, uh, those concerned with uh, 
unemployment voted for the five five-star movements, though those concerned with corruption voted for the five-star movements again. On the other hand, immigration and tax was an issue uh, mainly owned by the center-right, by the right, rather, because the center part is very little. Okay, we already said that uh, it, Italian public opinion has a negative perception of immigration. In fact, only 18% of Italians said that immigration is bad for the Italian economy. And uh, the others had, uh, let's say, a bleak image of immigration. If we correlate the uh, evaluation of immigration with the vote intention, we see clearly that uh, the, the vote for the five-star movements and for the, the right is very high among those who have a bad, a bad image of immigration. The other issue. Trust in parties, which is the anti-partisism uh, attitude spread among Italians. And only 18% only of Italians say that the politicians and the parties should take decisions in parliament. 54% said that on the, the other way around, the citizen rather than politicians should make decisions. Now, it comes, it comes with with, with little surprise that this uh, attitude is uh, strongly correlated with the vote for the right wing, the five star movements. EU, is uh, Italy's membership to the <coughs> Euro good or bad for Italy? Here the distribution of answers is more evenly spread. So one third, one third, one <coughs> third, basically. But we, if we correlate this with uh, the voting choice, you see that, I'm sorry, I left the ummale. <laughs> and uh, uh, the those who say that uh, Italy, that uh, being in Europe is good, they 50% of those <coughs> vote for the P Partito Democratico, but those who have uh, a negative evaluation, image, perception, judgment of the Euro voted for the, the opposition, let's say. The last point before moving to the more elaborated model. These are, these are the ratings of the political leaders, which is the people's evaluation of each leader on a scale 0 to 10. Uh, one thing is that uh, each uh, party's partisan give a higher rate to the leader of that party, of course. But then look at Say, Matteo Renzi and Paolo Gentiloni. No, Paolo Gentiloni has uh, even a higher, uh, has a higher rating than uh, the former, the, 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 the Matteo Renzi. Uh, so, what happens if we try to put together of, different, of these different pieces of information into a larger model? And this is a model based on only of the variables which I've shown which means that I don't take into account the social stratification of the voters, their part identification, so all these factors are not controlled for. But what happens if you just try to uh, estimate the voting choice based on uh, the government evaluation, the issues, trust in parties, leadership evaluation? This is the first, the first outcome. This is a, a, a regression, a multiple regression, what we see here is uh, how important each factor, each variable was for voting for a given party, a given party or coalition. You see, we can see that uh, the economic voting perspective you know, uh, has a strong impact you know, for all three parties. You know? Now, what it means is that uh, it's very strong for the PD, but it's also very strong for the five-star movements, less strong for the right. Uh, if you look at trust in parties, this is the factor which is most important to explain a vote for the five-star movements. If we look at uh, the euro, both five-star movements and the right, uh, is, for, for these parties, for both of them, is important, but not that important. While for immigration, if you look at the, the issue of immigration, this explains very well the vote for 
the uh, right wing. What happens if we then plug in the leadership variable, which is the, 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 the voter's evaluation of the leaders? See, as you can see for the higher bar, this becomes, the leadership becomes the most important variable explaining the vote, which means that trumps all the other variables affect. What, fortunately, does, what, which does not change is that the, the relation, the direction of the other variables still, still are the same, but their, their explanatory power is weakened. So to recap, if you look at the economic voting perspective, this is good. This is true for all parties. So a, a negative evaluation of, of the outgoing government, and this was the, the modal evaluation, most of people gave a negative evaluation, pushes for a vote, uh, pu pushes a vote for the, for the opposition. Trust in parties, which is uh, blaming the parties, the, all these, uh, all these the populist, uh, let's say, claim is important only to disc discriminate better between a vote for the established party in government and the anti-established party, the five, uh, five time movements. While immigration is important for the right-wing coalition, but the issue of immigration, net of the influence of the confounding influence of other variables is not important for the five-star movement. If we want to explain the five-star movement vote, and if we focus only on the immigration, we get the wrong image. The EU, the perception of the EU has a strong impact on all parties. And then there is this issue of leadership. So it appears, basically, at least based on this preliminary data analysis, that the image of the, of the leader has, been, has played an important role. And the fact that, as a final comment, the fact that Renzi evaluation was weaker than the other leaders, and it was weaker than Gentiloni's, who could have, who could have been the alternative leader, explains also part of the story. I will stop here. Thank you. Well, a lot of things to, to, to be made comment on, uh, and so if uh, there are questions. Uh. Yeah, a classical and obvious question, which Paolo m might be familiar with this, which is about uh, what you would expect to get if you would have party identification as control. But, I mean, th that's the naive objection. The, less naive side of this is that it might be interesting to see what would be the different effects of scores for Gentiloni versus leadership scores for Renzi once controlling party identification for the PD. And second, uh, what do you, there is this importance of leadership evaluation, but what is the content that you would expect? For example, even just on these two leaders, what, what would be the ingredients for this? About uh, government ap approval, is it true that in the past government ap approval was worse or not? At the end of uh, the government term, I mean. Because maybe in the past it was even worse than now. So maybe the PD didn't... Uh, uh, Disappear completely. No, no. <laughs> the, the, yeah, more or less. Uh, partisanship. Party identification. I mean, what, what, what has been the volatility rate, Alessandro? What is the, the, in, the index of change in 26. So, I mean, this is lower than uh, 2013. Lower, but still very high. Okay, so uh, with, with these values of electoral volatility, and uh, then uh, I think we, we need to question the the relevance, the meaning of partisanship, and uh, maybe partisanship is more and more based on uh, recent events. So policy outcomes explain partisanship more than the previous, previous uh, uh, 
let's say, uh, description of uh, a social uh, identity which has evolved over time and uh, which applies to the, to, the Amer to the United States system, which have had the same two parties for a long time. With new parties, um, this level of volatility, which is a sign of the weakness of the partisanship. But there are also, in the literature, and there are scholars who elaborate a different perspective on partisanship. So partisanship is just more the current reflection of uh, uh, an evaluation of the current policies, policy making of the parties. Uh, so it's a more, so it's not any longer an unmoved mover, but something which moves a lot. So what I would expect by plugging in partisanship in that equation is that the other variables would, like leadership would, would diminish their impact, but they would still be there. This is my... Now, if we make a counterfactual experiment, if we plug in the equation for explain the vote for the PD, the, the Gentiloni rather than Renzi's rating, well, this is interesting suggestion which can be pursued, but I don't have an answer now. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, in, the, in, the last, in the past 20 years, every single outgoing government had a, a popularity of less than 30 percent, while this government had 40 percent. Based on this uh, little fact, I made a forecast, which was uh, unfortunately also published. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper, and my forecast... In the that, most important newspaper, <laughs> let's say so. And, and my, forecast, my forecast was that the party, the PD, would get around 28, 30%. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I just changed, I made a mistake with the, the party. But, uh, uh, so I'm still uh, trying to to write a post-mortem explaining <laughs> why my forecast did not do well. Uh, yeah, I mean, economic forecasts base, uh, are based on the, the, same, the simpler, I mean, the same perspective. And what they do in order to, make, to account for something which goes wrong, they make a dummy. So if I would put a, a dummy for the, the European Parliament election when, uh, PD got 40%, maybe my estimate would have been closer to the actual outcome. But uh, you're right. So this is, uh, this is uh, something which needs, needs an explanation. Okay. Thank you again, Paolo. Uh, our last presentation, our speaker is uh, Luca Verzichelli, professor of political science from the University of Siena. He will be talking about... Uh, uh, the new parliamentary class, so those who have been elected uh, in the last election, uh, how different or similar to the past parliamentary class they are. Okay, thank you. Alessandra, I want to thank uh, NYU, uh, um, uh, Ellen Toscano and, and, and the colleagues who, who uh, organized this uh, uh, very nice event and very interesting event. Um, I'm a bit in trouble now because uh, different from all, all the uh, uh, friends who presented before, who, who present real papers, structured papers, or in any case, uh, uh, argue, interpretive argument, I will basically present a few questions and, um, and a very impressionistic uh, first discussion uh, with no real data. Um, I don't have excuse. The only little one could be the fact that uh, we we don't have pre-electoral things about uh, elected elites, but uh, we are really late in, in collecting that. And this is the reason I put only my name this, because I want to take the responsibility. But there's a, a, a nice uh, group, the band, uh, who's composed by Filippo, Nicola, uh, Martocchia, and Bruno Marino. We, we count to have, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to collect that, especially when we have a huge number of you know, newcomers, and, and that's, uh, uh, this is the only reason we are a bit late. Anyway, our question, I prefer to start with very uh, different from the title, which is maybe more ambitious. Um, 
uh, to start from descriptive um, questions, uh, and w we actually have a longer list. Uh, it's interesting to, to, to look at this, uh, this parliament because uh, it, it will be maybe a parliament uh, with a very short life. We don't know. Sometimes we, we argue that uh, this is the case. But at the same time, uh, and, and the presentations I heard this morning uh, demonstrate we don't have so many alternatives, both in terms of uh, uh, electoral ru rules. I don't see uh, um, new uh, and, and, let's say, promising ideas about changing in a very different way. We don't have uh, alternatives in terms of leadership. And we don't have, at the moment, and we don't have alternative in, in terms of uh, um, uh, party system format. And uh, what, what we, we saw with the Salvatore's presentation confirmed that. So maybe we should try to understand that this question should last for, for a while. Uh, not only, let's say, the, the reason of political uh, conjunction, let's say. And so uh, I, I want to present this, although they are really, really uh, basic. This is a turning point in terms of selection of ruling class. There is a shift to more centralized and personalized. We talk about leadership so, uh, so long before and, and even after the election. What, is, what, what are the effects of the new electoral system? This is something related to what Salvatore said. And uh, what the main elements of innovation in terms of political socialization? We actually, especially because of the Five Star Movement, we, we address a number of issues about the, the, the new uh, capabilities of, of uh, this new bunch of people in Parliament, and actually this is very much related with some aspect, including this uh, uh, anti-elitist approach. So we still have questions which are basically there from years, from five years, uh, if we connect this to the Five Star Movement, but even uh, from 25 years if we connect to leadership, uh, role, and populism. Now, first, uh, uh, hints. Recruitment procedure, in my view, created uh, very similar hierarchical effects. That means the leaders count. Nevertheless, the different approaches from the different leaders and parties. We had the, the no primary uh, choice uh, or the consultation uh, uh, with different uh, souls of the party. This can be applied to the PD in the last part of the uh, last legislative term, and even to Liberi Uguali. We had the coalition national coordination in the center right, which uh, reminds very much what happened under the Mattarello in the old days, with this strong uh, national centralized uh, uh, arena for leaders. We had, a, we know, the online process, but strongly controlled and, and, and basically used by very thin uh, elite, in a way, the elite of the meetup. Uh, in the in the five star, basically they all these these uh, these uh, um, uh, different let's say approaches they created room for leadership control, and actually we had the limited use. This is what the, the Catania uh, clarified in in, in in a recent uh, in a recent study, the limited use of multi candidate which used to be a classic during the Mattarello. A classic uh, a tool to, to you know to centralize only for top leadership and a few I call them locomotive candidates uh, the new uh, candidates used in in, in, in different uh, especially from the northern league uh, in the south where there, there were not natural candidates for this uh, uh, new kind of uh, offer from the party and then we have a few newcomers from the civil society selected by the leaders around the leaders friends of the leader supposed to be. <coughs> the results are, as you know, a new political elite, I told you, very uh, big number, large number of uh, newcomers, and all the media, they were, stre they were stressed at this. I, I, I'm not fully in, in agree with that, because I don't, I don't consider this a, 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 a totally new thing. I know there are 56% of newcomers. I know that this is a, somehow a, a, sign of what we should call a critical elections or a revolutionary elections if you want, but at the same time it's a pretty much a mechanic um, a result of the multiplication of seats for two uh, new parties basically, like not the League and above all uh, Five Star. And if you go to see and if you want to look to the quality of these people, you could have the impression sometimes you have a new 
bottles but uh, old wine. We have a relevant number of beginners who had been already candidate, especially in the uh, not a league and for uh, Forza Italia. We had a higher rate of re-election, 72% in the case of five-star movement. We have a fully elite-dominated process of parliamentary recruitment. The Leo, the, the uh, Libero Uguale case is a, is a, a, a cl classic example of an elite uh, maneuver. They basically put uh, very uh, new and sometimes very uh, promising names in the in the single member constituents where they had no choice to be elected and they kept all the, uh, the positions in the, uh, in the top list uh, for uh, D'Alema, basically. Uh, we had a high percentage of uh, interval elected, especially in Forza Italia, but even, the fact that even the five-star movement, they got for the first time an interval elected, the guy from um, uh, the consumer, uh, uh, association elected in the first uh, anti-establishment party, as uh, Salvatore correctly called, that is the Italia dei Valori, uh, demonstrate that there is now an elite, somehow professional elites of anti-elitists. And uh, use of multi-candidatures to protect incumbents. I told you that there was a very limited use, but the, this limited use was very, very clearly oriented to protect uh, somehow and particularly, I mention again Massimo D'Alema, but he was not the only one, of course. Now, uh, let's try to have a qualitative description given that I don't have full uh, data. Mayors and, lo and local political activism as the main elements of continuity for the Lega Nord. So we had a very consistent and, and, and I would say traditional now, after 25 years, a pattern of recruitment of the Lega Nord. Territory, mayors, people, even 25 old people, but with a, with a background from, from, the, from the local territories. But at the same time, in the South, this was impossible because there was no political class in, in, in the South. And here, you find these people around Salvini. Are they friends of Salvini? I put some, some people there. Uh, I don't know to what extent they could be friends of Salvini for, for how many years, let's say from now. Giulia Bongiorno was already in Parliament. Uh, I don't want to go to the details. You have some, somebody from the civil society, some good names from the civil society. You have the No Euro people. Uh, the guy close to Salvini is uh, Professor Bagnai, who was famous to, for his books about uh, uh, getting out from, from the Euro. And also we have a little quota for the old people you know, people who are not very supportive, uh, as you, as you, uh, this picture clearly shows. Oh, we have uh, only Umberto Bossi, someone said. I mean, we have only Umberto Bossi, but we have some people close to Bobo Maroni. To what extent Maroni is now a close friend of Salvini? I mean, this is something we should, uh, we should uh, get uh, more in detail in the, in the, in the uh, future uh, studies. Uh, well, for, for, for this other guy, the problem was simply to, to make his, his people elected. Coming from Siena, I can tell you that Padoan had a very, very difficult uh, uh, time, and in the end he won, but he won in, 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 a, in a constitution where uh, center-left people used to win with 20, 25% of advantage. So the problem of Renzi was uh, uh, what we saw in, in the presentations before, I don't want to get back to this, uh, uncertainty. Nevertheless, we had a relevant turnover, and this was basically the effect of the Renzi leadership because uh, there was no more Bersagnani, for an obvious reason, there was no more Bersagnani within the PD. But in the end, I don't know what is the impact of the leader because we had a very, very difficult process. You will remember the famous night of the uh, uh, candidate selection and so on and so on. We have many young newcomers. I don't know to what extent they could be associated to a leadership, and in any case, to what leadership, because uh, we are in the middle of this transition. We still have to know about that. If for sure, we have a, a very high cost of coalition paid by the Partito Democratico. First of all, they had to, to extend the, the quota of uh, uh, sure, uh, uh, candidature for those guys from uh, the, uh, the coalition, the, the stereotype of these uh, uh, lucky winners was uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Casini, who elect, was a candidate in Bologna, as you know. But uh, uh, we had other people elected. I counted uh, something like 13 leader, party leaders. I would mention Nencini, uh, Bonino, of course, and others. Elected and more or less now navigating in the mixed group 
because they were part of the coalition somehow, but they are basically the leaders with no soldiers in parliament. So we really look like um, 96 uh, Prodi um, in terms of composition of the, of the parliament. Another mixed situation is for the Movimento Cinque Stelle. I was really um, you know, happy to see from the presentation uh, that you are using these, uh, these terms like ambiguity or uh, somehow even the Lorenzo presentation, this kind of uh, double use, violence versus uh, position. I'm less sure than you that it's all violence. I wouldn't d define uh, uh, five star like this, but I, 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 th I see this, this kind of uh, ambiguity. And uh, first of all, uh, they had to invent some kind of uh, national uh, political class, and so they couldn't go for pure randomly selected people. And here we have the famous uh, Di Maio's team, a bunch of uh, economists, supposed to be very famous, uh, and, uh, well, some, some of them are, and uh, I remember uh, this poster saying that our age factor is higher uh, higher than 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 than, uh, than Paduan. This was uh, the, the big argument. I don't know how, how many voters they know the hedge factor thing. Anyway, uh, they won't, so they write. Uh, these these guys are basically representing different words. I I know the biographies of uh, these people. That I don't want to bore you with that, but they are completely different. One is from a far right, uh, from a far left. One other is very close to the right, uh, uh, monetarist economist, and the third one is. I don't know. So you can have Alesina, Bagnai, and I don't know uh, what kind of, of uh, post-Marxist economists in parliament. I don't know. Uh, that, that's a need. also a PhD from Siena. Yeah, I didn't want to say because. I, Our no, I didn't want to say because I, I already wrote to him because, uh, uh, you know, maybe there's a place as Genuine for me or Paolo. Uh, then we have an incumbent uh, rate, uh, uh, which is higher, as, as I told you. But these people, they change look. Not only in terms of, uh, as uh, we, we saw, I mean, uh, they change look physically. I mean, in many, in many, in many cases. Di Maio was the first. Di Maio is the presidential look now. Well, he always, because he was the vice president uh, of, the, of, the, of the lower chamber. But they change uh, approach. We uh, still uh, remember Paola Taverna's approach, but this was uh, all clips from the first republic of Movimento Cinque Stelle. Now they are changing this. Uh, this so the, the, the old uh, names that were trying to change a bit, and uh, of course, uh, Di Maio is uh, the, uh, the first evidence. And then we have a change in descriptive representation of the Five Star Movement. This, because some of them were recruited in different ways, and this was enough to change. We have a lot of uh, uh, graduated people, different from five years ago. We had uh, a lot of PhD holders. We had a lot of uh, intellectual media people. You know about Carelli and, and, and other people much more famous and established than the, the original bunch of candidates. And we have civil servants. Movimento Cinque Stelle used to be a private uh, sector uh, bunch of representatives. Now we have a more balance in this, in this respect. I try to close. The decline of Forza Italia leave room to uh, Fratelli d'Italia. I didn't speak about this uh, party, but I'd like to address a bit. And uh, not a link to propose a number of candidates from illiberal and far-right movements. Maybe you will tell you, it's my obsession, but uh, I completed the data set only for the Senate. I can tell you that we have, if you consider Fratelli d'Italia, which is a party splitting from Forza Italia because uh, they wanted to maintain the far-right uh, tradition, right? Then we have a, a bunch of uh, uh, post-fascist, uh, as you want to call them, post-MSI people in North Italia. We have Gasparri still in Force Italia, but he's the same. And if I count at the Senate, we have more than 10%. I just want to remind you that the, the highest uh, degree of uh, seat representation of MSI in the First Republic was 83 and if you add to that that we have 35% of people who clearly say that we don't care about uh, fascist versus anti-fascist, I have to argue. I don't know about the Euroscepticism. I agree with, the, with the Lorenzo with the, and with Filippo. But I can tell you that uh, we have roughly the majority of the Italian MPs now that, who simply don't care about the origin of our constitution, the roots of our constitution. And I'm not just referring to new neo-fascist, uh, let's say, uh, instances, but I refer to, to Europe because we have to see what they are going to, to, to say, and I refer to 
uh, other articles uh, of the first part of our Constitution. So this is a concern to me. We have a personalization, but personalization risks to be a temporary effect on the political elite. Because different from the past, 45 years of Andreotti, 25 years of, of Berlusconi, we risk to burn, for the reason I told you, a number of, of leaders in a, in, in, a, in a short time. So what, what is the leadership about uh, in terms of uh, uh, establishment of, of, a, of a political class? We have the paradox of Renzi. I wrote this and then I discovered uh, that you are using the same similar um, expression about the paradox of Renzi leadership legacy. The coalition strategy in the center left paves the way, or it can pave the way to a very fragmented parliamentary elite. And uh, we have an increasing variance within parties in terms of sociological and political backgrounds, at least, at least the higher, higher than the uh, recent past. Stronger role of independent candidates and opinion makers, all these media people elected somewhere, I don't know what can be their loyalty in the next uh, uh, couple of years. And the difficult process for institutionalization of new parliamentary leadership. Uh, of course, this is just my impression, so I beg your pardon if I will be completely uh, uh, contradicted by the uh, empirical reality in a few days from now. Thank you very much. Roberto. I'd like to know something about women in parliament. Women in parliament. I, th well, I thank you because I forgot about that. Uh, you know, very. Uh, no, that's a good point because you, I cannot tell you that this is not a change. This is a change and we have an increasing rate. Uh, two, two, two little things anyway. First, uh, this is again some kind of mechanical effect because a uh, five-star movement they have a sort of automatic promotion given this uh, randomization of the selection. So this is very much linked to the parliamentary group of Movimento Cinque Stelle. And the second is center-right. For the very first time, the center-right, they discover the issue of female representation since the very beginning of the Second Republic. So this is the only thing we have to, 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 to consider. So it's more balanced. It's more balanced. The percentage of women today in the house the percentage of women today in the House and the Senate is higher than yes. 2013. Yes. So the trend is still going yes. up. Yes. So it's and a record high. It's a record high. Yes. It's a record high. And uh, which is the, you say that the Five Star is the party with the highest percentage of women? Yes. Still the same ranking. Five More than the PD. Yeah. Five Star, PD, uh, and, and Center Right, and particularly the, the Lega Nord is the most problematic party for exactly the same picture with a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, two questions, if I may. I remember uh, very well the uh, night that uh, the uh, Five Star Movement uh, announced that it was going to uh, announce the government uh, before the election took place and uh, claimed that this was an absolute novelty and that the proposed government was going to consist of the uh, super competenti. Uh, and I was wondering to what extent you might share the first thought that went through my mind when that happened. I thought, well, okay, first of all, this will help it to, to overcome allegations of incompetence arising from its uh, management of uh, city councils such as Rome. But secondly, given that all the predictions as proved to be the case um, were that uh, it would emerge without an overall majority, if you announce a government beforehand, especially if they're independents, that will then enable you to say in the aftermath of the election, well, in a certain sense, we've been given a direct mandate by the Italian people, and that kind of increases the legitimacy of our claim to uh, the premiership. So I thought it was a very shrewd move on the part of the Five Star Movement. Uh, the second question, uh, and if you respond by saying, well, give me a crystal ball and I will tell you the answer, I will quite understand. However, my understanding is that uh, Di Maio is already at his, in, in his second parliamentary term and that the Five Star Movement has a policy of not allowing more than two party terms. What is going to happen to Di Maio when we get to the end of this parliamentary term? Uh, will they find somebody else, or will they find some excuse to enable him to stay on? Oh, Pasquale, go, yeah. go ahead, sorry. 
So it seems, listening at you, that in this anti-establishment culture, now the selection of the candidate is much more centralized. So more people are against the party, more the secretary of the party becomes uh, powerful and controlling everything. That's a beauty. The second point is that, listening again at you, it seems to me that this participation in the Five Star Movements looks a little bit like the participation in the Chinese Communist Party. I've been working with them and have a quite clear picture. Uh, there is no ideology. The, the, the Chinese Communist Party is a post-ideological party. You may support position uh, like Carl Schmitt or Friedman or Hayek, but if you are part of this party, you, are, you hope to be part of an elite. So it seems that the ideology is not connected with contents, but with social status. So what, what is, uh, your, I'm, I'm understanding what you said. Luca, please. Well, I start from this, I have exactly this impression, so I don't have anything to, 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 to add. The only thing is that, uh, let's say, different from the Communist Party in China, Movimento Cinque Stelle is not representing, uh, let's say, uh, history uh, uh, of uh, political theory. So in, in, in a way, they, uh, they, they should change their mind. And this is connected with what uh, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, question or comment by, by, by Jim. Uh, uh, they, they probably uh, have to change, uh, first of all, because uh, they have, they pass from, let's say, the responsiveness to, to responsibility, to use a, a, a classic, a classic uh, uh, dialectic uh, uh, concept. But uh, uh, I don't know if they will be able to, to change their non statuto up, up to reverse a total point of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, revolution from this. And this is linked to the, the role of Di Maio. I don't know what is the, the role of Di Maio uh, could be, because if they don't get an agreement and the Di Maio premier uh, uh, you know, picture disappears, in any case, it will have a, s a certain rule because it, it, can it can have a control of some part of the parliamentary elite. In any case, they have a reserve and have the other Movimento Cinque Stelle with a guy who did, was not elected. So just to, to be a little bit of, run, over, over joking on this, uh, we can have uh, uh, Di Battista next time and Di Maio uh, in, in 10 years from now. But, but that's uh, really... Uh, not crystal ball, this is fantascienza. Uh, uh, I think there was another question no, about the governo dei, dei competenti. I think this is an important point because uh, it's a discussion somehow linked to leadership and populism. Berlusconi was having this, and uh, I, I wrote about Berlusconi's minister in, 10 years ago, and I discovered this, uh, the importance of uh, you know, using populist argument and putting these people, including you know, the famous media or Levelini or whatever. And at the same time, uh, uh, you know, showing the idea of competence. And we had, in fact, very successful people, like uh, uh, you, you may remember the guy who invented the no smoking uh, law. This was one of these uh, Berlusconi uh, inventions. So, il governo dei competenti is still there, and it's still a, you need the leader, to form a team, and you lead some kind of populist anti-party thing. It's still there. But again, this applies to these guys who were in the package of Di Maio. If Di Maio will, will have to do, and he will have to do, a different kind of government, I don't know if these guys will be protagonists of this. We have one more question. Yes, please. It's not properly a question because uh, I am a representative member of FISA movement. I am very happy about uh, all this attention to our movement. I'm Carla Ruocco, a member of parliament. Um, this is my second uh, experience in parliament, and, uh, but uh, I, <laughs> I, do, I don't represent. So um, in this uh, 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 
uh, in the way uh, you represented the, the member of uh, uh, the first uh, um, the first members of uh, Parliament of Five Star Movement, because, uh, for instance, I graduated at 22 years old uh, with honor in economy uh, in Federico II in Naples, and I've been working for 20 years in the uh, field uh, of uh, tax. Uh, and so I have a lot of experience uh, to tell uh, in, in the Parliament. It's not so uh, uh, true that uh, representatives of Five Star Movements are only uh, not experienced people uh, and so on. It's a very simple uh, way uh, to represent this uh, very big movement and uh, it's not so uh, <laughs> uh, true that uh, it's uh, si similar to Chinese parties and so, uh, and so on, because uh, I uh, was elected uh, um, because I was uh, very interested to the problems of my um, uh, my district, my, my city, and uh, I think it is uh, a very important answer uh, to a behavior of uh, politicians uh, that uh, was very far, very, very far from from uh, uh, the uh, the life uh, the, the the life problem uh, daily problem of citizens so it's a, it's a very complex uh, movement uh, composed by different people is not so easily described that's uh, my <laughs> opinion and my experience thank you thank you thank you a lot uh, uh, Luca, one. No, just to say just that that I just reply. report the statistics and uh, mainly official statistics. But uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there is no competences. I, I'm saying that this is a random kind of thing where we find a majority of people who the lower level of classic uh, um, characteristics of the political class, including uh, uh, education. Although this is not supposed to be necessary, uh, um, uh, this is if uh, um, uh, element for 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 uh, the other thing. It is just I want to, to to link to the problem of competences. The Movimento Cinque Stelle had a very uh, low level of lawyers, which is another classic aspect of political class, and also lawyers are growing. It's That's good. To, That's good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.